Hi everyone, welcome to the video. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you would know that I absolutely enjoy taking photos and videos of the sun and moon. In fact, when I started doing videos of the P950, those were two of the first videos that I did. In this video, I'm going to expand on those videos and show you some additional stuff that you can do with the P950. Let's go. Okay, so basically this is the ethernet cable leading to my house and then it goes outside to this table and I have an ethernet patch cord that goes to my HDMI over CAT6 extender and then I have my splitter and here we can see the HDMI connection coming from my camera that's the input and then the output we have this connect HDMI connection going to the monitor and we have this one going to the HDMI over CAT6 extender. I have here my inverter. So basically the inverter is getting the 12 volt from this battery right here. I'm using a 12 volt 18 ampere hour battery. That should get it running for a while. And I have a power strip that's connected to that. And then I have all my items like then I have my monitor. I have my splitter and I have my HDMI extender getting power from this uh, inverter that's connected to this 12 volt battery and so basically that's how you would set up if you're out in the field and you need power to run all these devices uh, let's say you want to stay inside your vehicle and you or you have a, like a group of persons inside an auditorium and you're outside on the roof, uh, then you have a monitor to see what's happening, and then you also have the people who are inside who are watching what's on the second screen through that splitter. Now, while my setup works, it is not the most efficient way of doing it. I simply did a setup using hardware that I had in my possession. The reason why it's not the most efficient is the fact that I'm using a battery then I use an inverter to get 120 volts AC. Then I use the power bricks for the devices to bring the voltage back to 5 volts DC. That's just a waste of power and the unnecessary use of additional equipment. If you want to do a similar setup, here's how I recommend you do it. We can start off by mounting the P950 onto the tripod. The next thing we want to do is get an HDMI cable that has a standard HDMI connector on one end and a micro HDMI connector on the other end. And don't worry about the multiple pieces of hardware I'm going to mention in this video. I have provided links in the description below to all the items that, so that you can find them easily. So after connecting the HDMI cable to the P950, let's add an HDMI splitter to the mix and connect the cable to the input port. Now that we have the P950 connected to the input, we're going to connect two standard HDMI cables to the two outputs, and we'll connect one of those cables to a small 7-inch monitor. The reason why we're doing that, as you might recall from a previous video, is that whenever you use the HDMI port on the P950, the screen and viewfinder are disabled. So we need the small screen to see what we are filming and also to make sure it's properly focused. If that 7-inch screen is too small, we could also use a bigger monitor like the one shown here. Later on I'll explain why I selected this specific monitor. The next thing we are going to need is an HDMI over CAT6 extender, which you can see right here. This is a kit that has a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter is what we're going to plug the second HDMI cable into. Next, I recommend a 100 foot category 6 ethernet cable that's going to run from the transmitter to the receiver, as you saw in my setup. That receiver was connected to the TV in my living room so that the family could sit comfortably and watch the sun on a big screen. Apart from the obvious benefit of not having my family crowd around me to watch a lunar or solar eclipse on a tiny screen on my camera, there are also some other practical applications to this. Let's take a school setting. This could prove very beneficial in science class and could even be part of a virtual field trip. The elderly, infirm, or those confined to a nursing home could also benefit from this setup. In many nursing homes and assisted living facilities, there is usually a channel dedicated to announcements and public information. Video of a solar or lunar eclipse could be fed into that channel and serve as a backdrop while announcements are scrolled across the screen. However, 
Not all schools might have a TV in each classroom, and some schools in large cities might not have an area where students are able to go outside and watch an eclipse. In a situation like that, we could use this setup to send the images to a big screen in an auditorium or gymnasium. For those schools that do not have a room large enough to see the entire school population, we could take it a step further and use a combination splitter slash extender that has multiple outputs. That way we can send the image to multiple rooms. You could probably even group students according to their grade and therefore have an independent discussion in each room. Alternatively, you could have one teacher on the roof monitoring the camera and since the microphone on the P950 sends the audio captures along with the image, one teacher could address everyone who is watching the video feed. As you can see in the graphic, instead of using a monitor, the person who is monitoring the camera could also wear a set of goggles with an HDMI input. This is very practical because a bright sunlight could make the viewing of a monitor very difficult when outdoors. So now that we have looked at how to wire all the devices together, let's now look at getting power to all the devices. We'll start off with a 12 volt battery and personally, I like to use this 12 volt 18 ampere hour battery. It has the right amount of power to last a long time and it's not too heavy. Next, we're going to need a no-code terminal harness with a female socket on the other end. Using the screws that come with the battery, we can now secure the harness to the battery's terminals, making sure that the colors match up. Shorting a battery's terminals by accident can be very dangerous, especially when working with these high capacity batteries. What I do is cut a piece of soft plastic and then place it over the battery's terminals, after which I use electrical tape to secure the plastic in place. You will also notice that the terminal harness has a fuse box on the cable. If the connectors or equipment should accidentally short, the fuse would then blow and open the circuit, thus preventing an electrical fire. At any rate, the design of the connectors makes it virtually impossible for them to short, which is why I like to use this brand to make my battery connections. The next thing we're going to need is a NOCO male-to-male coupler, which will plug into the harness. Next, we're going to need a NOCO female socket 12 volt plug accessory. With all these cables connected together, we can now plug in the three socket 12 volt adapter with USB ports. Next, we will need some DC car charge 12 volt cables. And as you can see from this next graphic, we need them to power the extender as well as the monitor. That's the reason why I selected this monitor, because it requires a 12 volt input, unlike most monitors which require a 19 volt power source or a 120 volt AC wall outlet. This next graphic shows a charger which will be used to charge the battery, and you can simply clip on the alligator clips to the terminals for charging the battery. However, in my case, I do things differently because all my 12 volt battery operated stuff use NOCO connectors. So, instead of having to remove the plastic protector each time I need to charge the battery, I simply acquired a NOCO extension cable, cut off the female socket, and then wired it permanently to the charger. So for charging, instead of having to remove the plastic protector from the battery's terminals, I just plug the charger directly in using the NOCO connector. Bear in mind though that this is a trickle charger and it doesn't charge very fast. If you need a faster charger, it's going to cost you. I place links for faster NOCO charging in the description below. So now that we have everything laid out, let's talk about something else that's very important. If you're going to be out in the sun for an extended period capturing a solar eclipse, the camera is bound to overheat, especially if you're here in Florida where it can get very hot and humid, even in spring. To fix that problem, I decided to improvise by using a styrofoam project board. I measured the diameter of the camera and cut off a piece of styrofoam that would be just big enough to block the sunlight from hitting the camera's body. Next, I measured the diameter of the lens housing and cut a hole that was just big enough for me to get the housing through the styrofoam. In this case, it's better to cut it slightly smaller and then carefully cut away any excess that prevents the lens housing from going through. I removed a little bit each time and then tested it constantly until I finally got the perfect fit. So with my sun shield in place, I'm ready to film the sun. If you didn't watch my earlier video about filming the sun, here's something you need to bear in mind. Do not point your camera at the sun unless you have mounted a solar filter onto the lens. Otherwise, your camera sensor will get damaged permanently.
basically, this is a setup that you would use if you're filming the solar eclipse, or even if you're taking pictures and you want to have a monitor so that you can see what's happening. But you also want to send that image to persons who would be watching, like in an auditorium or another room somewhere. This is the exact setup that you would use. However, there's something that some of you probably saw in the recording that we need to correct. And if you didn't see it, I'm gonna emphasize it even more by using what happens if we record the moon at night. But in order for that to happen, we're gonna need some darkness and the moon. So let's switch from day to night. Okay, so that's better. It's night, uh, and so that it, now that it's night, I don't need this anymore. I'll go back to my regular glasses and we can take this off. Good. So, we're at night, and now we can film the moon. As you can see in this sped up video, after focusing on the moon and locking your tripod in place, the moon is going to eventually move out of frame. Why is that? Let's look at the simulation to find out why. You'll notice that the Earth spins in a certain direction and the Moon also orbits the Earth in that same direction, as well as spin in the same direction on its axis. However, the Earth's rotation is slightly faster than the Moon's orbit, which means that the Moon appears to move from east to west across the sky. But in reality, we are spinning away from the Moon and then later on we begin to catch up with it again. Let's slow the simulation down to get a better look. You see this blue line here? Keep your eyes on that and let's start the simulation again, but slower this time. As you can see from the simulation, any given point on the Earth's surface will rotate away from the Moon and then catch up again. But you will also notice that the Moon's rotation and orbit are such that the same side of the Moon always faces the Earth. The rotation of planet Earth means that you will have to constantly move your camera to keep the moon or the sun in frame. And that is not humanly possible, especially at high zoom levels. To fix that problem, we need some help. After reading several Amazon reviews and watching multiple YouTube videos, I have come to the conclusion that the best device to help solve that problem is a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. The Star Adventurer comes in three flavors. If your only camera is a P950 or similar, then the Astro Pack is perfect for you. However, if you plan to use a DSLR camera with long range lens or a telescope, then you will need the additional accessories in the Pro Pack. I've provided links for both in the description below. Since I don't own the Skywatcher yet, I'm not going to try and explain how to use it. Rather, I've provided a link to a very easy to follow video from another YouTuber who has used it. Within the next 12 months, there will be three opportunities to film or take pictures of a solar eclipse. The first of the three will start over the Indian Ocean on the 20th of April 2023 as shown in the graphic on screen and end over the West Central Pacific Ocean. Only a small portion of Australia and a few islands in Indonesia will be in the zone of totality, the area that will experience complete darkness. The second solar eclipse will occur on October 14, 2023 and will start over the US state of Oregon before traveling down to Texas, Central America, Colombia and then cut across Brazil before ending just off Brazil's coast in the Atlantic Ocean. On April 8, 2024, a solar eclipse will start in the South Pacific Ocean, cut across Mexico and Texas, and then traverse the United States in a diagonal path before entering Canada via Maine. It will eventually end in the North Atlantic, about 450 miles southwest of Ireland's southern tip. I don't think I will make it to Indonesia or Australia, but stay tuned to my channel to see where I'll be viewing it from when it occurs over the United States.